All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our class on Has American Christianity Failed by Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. We've been talking about good works and doing so at some length from a couple of different vantage points, theologically speaking. We'll continue in the chapter here momentarily, but let's begin with an invocation of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, if we return to page 144, we'll maybe touch on some themes that we focused on last week. But my intention is to kind of get up and gallop away into into new dimensions of this chapter. If you look at page 144, you will see, look toward the top third of the page, and you'll see a paragraph that begins, the enmity, the enmity of the world and hatred of the devil are marks of the church and marks of the Christian. The Christian is a soldier engaged in a war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. St. Paul writes, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In the next paragraph, we read that the Christian life is a battle. And so you see this motif of being a soldier, being engaged in battle. And that next paragraph talks about it being a war, a war against the devil that Christ has already won, but a war that we are called to participate in. Christ, you know, it's paradoxical. Christ gives us the victory but allows us to participate in that victory. He crushes the serpent's head but then arranges it so that the serpent's head will be crushed under our feet as well in due time, as St. Paul writes to the Romans. Now, a lot of what we discussed here, and maybe the way that is simplest to understand, I think what Wolf Miller is trying to articulate over and against American Christianity and their view of good works is here in Romans 6. And again, his point has been that you don't reform the old Adam. It's progressing and sanctification is not a matter of strengthening the free will and uh, retraining the old Adam, as it were, but really rather of a bifurcation, a, a separation and severing that takes place so that you see that you have a new nature and an old nature and there is a separation between these two. There's a mortal combat between the two. The old nature wants you to have nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with uh, his his salvation, his virtues. And the new man, likewise, is contrary to that and opposed to that and wants you to have nothing to do with Satan, nothing to do with his false beliefs or vices. So if you look at Romans 6, 1 through 7, St. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, this is important for us to slow down and focus on a little bit because this has been an answer given to um, American Christianity and its its insistence that you know you need to do better, try harder, exercise your free will, this kind of theology, pep talk theology, and then the antithetical reaction to it has often been that we are set free from such things. Okay. So, well, what does freedom from trying not to sin look like? Freedom to sin, all in the name of grace. So it does benefit us to slow down with St. Paul. What are we to say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No, continuing in sin is not Christian freedom. When people talk about, for freedom Christ has set you free, and the gospel is all about freedom, we must never come to think that it is freedom to sin, freedom to set aside the commandments of God. That is not ever a biblically articulated freedom. 
And we see that confirmed here in this verse. We are not to continue into sin. We are not free to continue into sin that grace may abound. So St. Paul writes, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He who knew no sin became sin for us, and that sin was crucified and killed and buried and put away forever through the passion and death of Christ. We have been crucified with him. We have been buried with him, and therefore we have died to sin. We cannot live to it any longer. You might think of it this way, too, that if Christ came to take away sin, why would he ever want us to be free in sin? <laughs> Those two ideas are completely opposed to one another. Okay, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now you can see what St. Paul is doing here. So Christ has died and been buried. We died with him and were buried with him. Christ is bodily raised from the dead. We're not yet bodily raised from the dead. But just as he is risen by the glory of the Father, so too we are risen to walk in newness of life. So there is a kind of spiritual resurrection that has already taken place within us. We're waiting for the bodily resurrection, sort of waiting for the body to catch up with the soul. But the the spiritual resurrection already takes place in baptism. When you come up out of those baptismal waters, you are spiritually resurrected from the dead. Completely an aside, but this is where um, you, know, you can see a kind of two resurrections theology taking place because you're raised at baptism, you're raised on the last day. They're two sides of the same coin. But this would be an origin. So, St. Paul continues, third line from the top of 145, For if we have been united with him, with Jesus, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So at its root, the gospel is freedom from the guilt and punishment of sin. Now, that's it's somewhat nuanced because, of course, if you rob a bank and you repent, uh, the church is going to forgive you in the name of Christ Jesus and communicate his forgiveness to you, but you're still going to have to go to jail. So there's, there's a temporal consequence that is not necessarily removed. And obviously that's the case in many and various ways, that the temporal consequences of sin cannot be removed and sometimes are exceedingly tragic and terrible and do have bearings on other people's spiritual lives. So it's never to be minimized. But we do know that the gospel sets us free from the eternal consequences of our sins. And then as that gospel has its way with us, as the Holy Spirit regenerates us, there begins to be a freedom from other sins. It's a loosing of those shackles and chains. It, as In the same way that sin begins with your thought and then goes to word or deed, so also sin is put to death in just this way that the new man comes with new thoughts and new words and new deeds and has a reaction over and against the sinful flesh that he sees remaining that is hostile. So what is the act of confession? It's in the first place a manifestation of what's gone on in my mind. My mind has changed. This is sometimes, if you take the really the, the root of metanoia, which is the Greek word for repentance, it means a change of mind. 
Now, we can go astray with this, but we don't need to. The mind being the root of a person. So the very first thing that God does in converting us, the very first thing you'll notice is, what you used to do wholeheartedly, you now don't. There's a change of mind such that you go, I wish it wasn't this way. You know, prior to conversion, it's not as though you don't have a conscience. You do have a conscience. That conscience can be weakened drastically over time and eventually go away, at least on a given topic or two. But you kind of go, when you're, when you're unconverted, you go, well, I wish my conscience wouldn't bother me. I kind of feel terrible for being that way. But, you know, I'm going to go work at the soup kitchen or mow my neighbor's lawn or have a self-care day. And by the end of it, I'll feel better. I'll have made atonement for that sin. And so you just kind of bumble through life, never really in opposition to yourself, always thinking the same thing and then marveling at the fact that you feel in any way bad that you did said thing. But now as a Christian, an entirely new thing happens, a metanoia, a change of mind, such that the first kind of symptom of the new man is you go, I, that's not right. I don't like that part of me. I don't like those thoughts, I don't like those words, I don't like those deeds. And as the new man becomes stronger in the word and spirit, he's able to bring word against those words and deeds. And that's the confession of sins. So the confession of sins is a hostile act against yourself. You're engaged in moral combat and you're saying, those are the things I thought and I despise them. Those are the things that I said and I regret and despise them. Those are the things that I've done and I regret and despise them. Right? Then we can start to bear fruits worthy of repentance. We can start to correct our foul words with good words. I'm sorry I sinned against you. And we can start to correct our bad deeds with good deeds. Zacchaeus steals from people as a tax collector after a single lunch with the Lord, he says, I will restore fourfold that which I have taken. St. Uh, John the Baptist likewise admonishes those who are baptized to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now, those fruits worthy of repentance are in complete contrast and opposition to the fruits of unrepentance, the fruits of sin. And indeed, those things choke each other out. So there's never this kind of compromise between this, the, these two. It, it is, again, life and death struggle on the basis of baptism. Now, you can see for us as Lutherans, then, why the small catechism is not a, a merely a manual for doctrine, but a manual for life, so that every day our, the doctrine we learn in the catechism is alive in our perception, is alive in our lives. We wake up, we make the sign of the cross, remembering our baptism, remembering also who our chief and foremost enemy is. Not the Democrats or the Republicans, not, the, you know, not anyone else in the world or the church, but rather me, myself, and I. I'm my own worst enemy. I'm the first one I have to oppose. The very first thing that's going to stand in my way of, of carrying out my God-given, God-pleasing vocations is me. So I need to prepare to put me to death all day long through drowning. And where the, where the me gets the upper hand and is thinking bad things, saying bad things, doing bad things, and maybe that battle of stopping him is already lost, I need to do the next best thing, which is push him back into the baptismal font, as it were, and drown him by repentance and fruits worthy of repentance. Okay? Not by way of any kind of, oh, I've got to atone for this, I've got to make up for this, I've got to put a credit where there was a debit, not like that. But insofar as I can undo what the old self has instantiated, that's what I want to accomplish. That's what I want to do. Please. Um, what you're explaining, like, okay, it's easy to say than ten. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have to probably have always in mind that the word of the devil uh, which is all lies, and with the word of God, 
for us to be able to identify, starting with temptation, like you said, putting ourselves uh, to death, you know, our old Adam, our, our sin. But without the word of God, we cannot identify that. Mm -hmm. Not even the temptation, not even our own selfish desires. Mm -hmm. And constantly uh, those lies that we can we hear from you know from the moment that we wake up until we go to sleep mm -hmm. everywhere. So can you uh, how can we, you know, just not meditating or studying the word of God daily or every, like the King David says, meditate in the word of God mm -hmm. daily to be able to combat all these things that, you know, trying to take us away or, or and, it's, and also when we fall into temptation, the sin spiritually starting to blind us from the word of God. Can you can you put all this a little bit more simple so mm -hmm. it's a it's a little bit confusing. How can we walk this journey mm -hmm. with less simple concept and easier for us to mm -hmm. sure. carry on. Well I'm gonna be terribly unoriginal with all of this. <laughs> Uh, this this idea, of course, is found in, in our Lord Jesus, and maybe I would just choose this word first, and that is sufficient for the day is the trouble thereof. And that includes all the trouble of the self, the world, and the devil. So the first thing we need to do, by the way, the, I think this is chiefly where the devil's attacking us is in disorder, because he's simply creating, he's creating utter disorder and havoc so that we can't even get our footing and then everything looks too big and too complex and too wishy-washy to ever be able to figure out even which way we're going. And we experience this corporately as a people. We experience this individually and personally. Our moods shift this way and that. It's, it's part, we could do a deeper analysis on being plugged into the internet and the algorithms that are constantly feeding you this or that and how little control you have in that and where that takes your mind on a given day. So we have all of these tools and machinations that we expose ourselves to that only amplify and increase this sense of un out of control, chaos, uh, disorder, unable to get my footing, unable to get any. And so I think then that, that creates right ground for somebody to come swinging in on their gospel champion rope and tell you none of it matters Jesus died for you just believe that and live however you will that's really attractive because it's an ordering sin <laughs> it's an ordering principle the problem is it's just not faithful to the Bible it's not true in any way so sufficient for the day is the trouble thereof then our task in the first place is simplicity and order that's the modern task so this is where um, so you find it in, in Paul and the Apostles. You find it all the way throughout the church. But this idea of one day at a time, one moment at a time, focusing on vocation and commandments. But how you would do this very, very concretely is, is again, what we've been saying. And this is, this is worthy of practicing and doing. I, I'm not going to get hung up on the details with you because that's sort of like the difference between legalism and order is if I tell you you have to say the Lord's Prayer X amount of times or you're sinning, and if you're sinning, maybe you're separated from God. You see, this is all legalism, and this is all wending works into justification. I'm not interested in doing that at all. But I am in these chaotic and completely disordered times interested in saying God's people have always done this in one way, shape, or form, literally from the beginning to the present. God's people have always done this. And that is, it just starts very basically with a prayer in the morning, a prayer in the evening, and a prayer at the meals. It's, it's just a pattern. It's just how it goes. If that's, if that's too legalistic to you, then I guess you can have the alternative, <laughs> which is a chaotic mess and an inability to figure anything out. So the catechism sets before us just, and again, the catechism isn't legalistic about this, make the sign of the cross and say the Our Father. 
That would sort of be the bare minimum. Make the sign of the cross and have another morning prayer. That would be an equal minimum. The sign of the cross is just important because it's reminding you of your baptism. That's who we are. We're baptized people. That's what you're reading here in Romans 6, that the entire new life in Christ is a baptismal life. It's a life of continually drowning the old man and continually rising as the new man. So that's why the sign of the cross is important. Now, if you can just remember your baptism without the sign of the cross, well, then do that. I mean, fine. But I find great benefit and value in making the sign of the cross because it's, you remember that you're not just baptized, you're baptized into Christ, that his righteousness covers you now and always. When you're touching your body, you're remembering, even just in a very subtle way, I'm a human being, and I'm perishable, and I'm made of flesh, and because Christ took flesh, I have salvation in him. But then all his promises and, and benefits and blessings are made also to this fallen flesh that, that it will die and be made new, purged, cleansed, clean, so that it's holy and immortal and righteous in his sight forever. This body will rise. And so I like it. I like the sign of the cross. I like remembering your baptism. And that's just step one. I mean, you can, you can do that before you even roll out of bed. Your alarm goes off or you're retired and the crows get to you and that's how you wake up. Then you, uh, you, you make the sign of the cross. You can say the Our Father. You can say another prayer. You can say, I, I think the most the catechism, you know, typically suggests would be you would do the, and it doesn't, the order doesn't really matter. You find it in different places, but you would do the first three chief parts. So you would do the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Our Father. Okay. So, so that's what, that's how your morning begins. And you're already thinking vocationally. You're thinking in terms of like, what do I have to do? If God doesn't want you to do that, you probably shouldn't do it. Now, if you think, well, I, I've got a guilty conscience about doing this because it's really a waste of my time and I'm neglecting this other thing that God should... Okay, well, there's your sign. <laughs> then don't do that. Set that aside for another day and focus on what you do need to get done today. That's your vocation and calling according to the Ten Commandments. So you just simply progress then until breakfast, which may be only a matter of minutes, and that's fine, whatever your routine is. And then at breakfast, you're giving thanks to God. A very, a very godly thing to do, and Luther includes this in his table prayer, is you've got a section of scripture. Um, the eyes of all look to you, O Lord. You give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless us, and these are your gifts which we receive from your bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a fantastic meal prayer. It's got scripture embedded into it. Um, what a wonderful practice insofar as you're able to start f feeding your soul with God's word as you feed your body with the gifts he's freely given. So that's a great pattern. Um, if you can't do it and you just want to pray the table prayer, pray the table prayer and receive it as gift. It's wonderful. If you find your mind skipping through it, just doing it rotely like it's a box to check off, stop, put down your fork and silver and like a little kid, fold your hands and close your eyes and focus on the words. The same is true in the morning, by the way, when you say the Lord's Prayer and you're at the fifth petition and you realize you didn't actually even though your mouth said the other petitions, you didn't actually say them, that's fine. Go back and pray it again. And, and just have that wrestle with the flesh and have that insistence upon, you know, no one's ever going to pray the Lord's Prayer perfectly. Luther says in the history of the church, no one's ever accomplished that. But you can at least get to a point where you say, I was mindful during each of the petitions. I mean, there's little secrets and, temp and, tri and, and tricks and tips as well, like say it out loud. It helps, you so that it helps you so that your mind doesn't wander. It makes you focus and really articulate what it is you're thinking. If as you're praying the Lord's Prayer, or even as you're praying the meal prayer, if something pops into your mind that you need to pray about, take a moment and pray about it. If you need to stop on the third petition of the Lord's Prayer because it conjures something up in your life or in your day, stop and pray about that. Same thing with you know your, your lunch prayer. All right, so what you're doing is, and I'm sorry if this is belaboring the point, but what you're doing is you're breaking up your day into small and handleable sections that are always bookended with God, with speaking with God. You wake up in the morning confessing what he's done for you in baptism. You're speaking to him those words that he's already spoken and given to you. And then you're progressing to lunch. And at lunch, you might even say, 
uh, or yeah, well, breakfast. And then you might even say if there's a couple hours between, hey, these are the things I was tempted with or these are the ways I already fell into sin. God have mercy. Have that little confession absolution. Then from breakfast to lunch, there's another narrow little gap, and that's what you're paying attention to. You're trying to live a life that's circumspect that's, and that's quickly reconciled. This is what I should have done. This is what I didn't do. This is what I know I can table tomorrow. And so then lunch, and from lunch to dinner, and dinner to night. That's And then night, the same kind of cate- catechismal pattern of uh, cross, making the sign of the cross, confessing your sins, praying the Lord's Prayer, adding to that. Now, once you start to kind of ground this, this is an order and, a, and an ebb and a flow of life and a way to be mindful throughout the day. And then the battle does become to be mindful. And the confession of sins is not just, well, God, I plead guilty before you of all sins, which is fine in a general sense, but now it's these specific sins committed at these specific moments of the day, and I plead your grace and mercy for that. And then there's endless room to expand. But I would just say, especially if you're starting out, especially if you've never tried this, like just start at the bare minimum. That's what I do. And if you fall away from it, start again at the bare minimum. It's just constant, continual war and battle between the realities of life and our fallen flesh and trying to live this way. So nobody does it perfectly. But if you get to a point where you're strong enough and you're, you're doing the three chief parts every morning, great, add a psalm. Stronger still, more time still, great, add God's word. Um, some other part of God's word, I mean. Um, begin to read uh, through a, a Pauline epistle or through a gospel. And the same thing can be done or supplemented any other way. And, and then the church has all kinds of ways to amplify this. There are seven different offices throughout the day where you can pause and pray if you want to do those. So the upper end really has no limit, but I don't think probably most modern American people, myself included, have any business considering praying seven times a day and spending hours upon hours in God's Word. It's just not likely. What's likely to happen is you're going to burn out in a week. That's what's likely. And then you're not going to do anything. And then you're going to think that, well, maybe Rhodey's a legalist because he gave me this advice. No. Start really small with the pattern of God's people that they've done for millennia upon millennia. And, and um, build yourself up in humility in that simplistic way. So hopefully that makes sense. It makes everything more small, more real, more manageable, instead of just at the end of the week going, gosh, I'm sorry for all my sins, I'm ready for communion. By the end of the week, you've got a pretty good sense of these were my major failures. Now, I plead guilty before God of all sins, but these were the major failures that I want to confess to him, that I want to be mindful of as I approach his table to receive the gift of his body and blood for my forgiveness. It all becomes much more concrete, much more real, much more ordered, quantifiable. And I think that in our modern age, this is really where the battle lies. And and in disciplining ourselves along these ways, what we're going to also find out is that there are various other behaviors we do that are incompatible. Even if they're not strictly speaking sinful in and of themselves, they're incompatible with what we're trying to do. It's incompatible um, for me, and I discovered this a long time ago, to have like a social media account that I'm completely active in. Because I'm always checking it and I'm always wanting to respond or I'm neglecting to respond where I need to and so much of it is about you know what's the what's the reaction is it positive is it negative are there more likes or dislikes now I guess they've taken away the dislike buttons you can't get your feelings hurt but but in in pondering all this it's just like that's incompatible with the actual concrete vocations God's given me to do I mean, sometimes it's true even like I've messed around with uh, being on a Reddit, having the Reddit app or the Instagram app. And what do I end up doing with those things? Mindlessly scrolling, just mindlessly scrolling and being entertained. And at a certain point, you just kind of realize that's incompatible with what I'm trying to do. I would it would be better for me to be bored right now and to be just sitting there bored than to be doing this. And, and very typically what you're being led to do through those things, too, is to, like, buy. Because you're, you read an article about how something will help you. And the next thing you know, you're over on your Amazon app or your eBay app. Instagram's especially like this. In many ways, it's just all flowing advertisements. You're clicking on something and buy. So then you just realize, I'm not even resting. I'm being advertised to and shopping nonstop and constantly. 
And you go, that's antithetical to what I'm trying to do. It would be better for me to be bored. It would be better for me to read a book. It would be better for me to take out the trash. It would be better for me to literally do almost anything. Reorganize my silverware drawer for the nth time would be more beneficial than scrolling through another set of meaningless, inane, possibly sinful, definitely tempting uh, pictures or articles or whatever the case may be. So there's a um, there's a development that happens and a warfare that happens um, when we pay attention, when we narrow it all down to where we can actually see the pieces on the board. It becomes an entirely different game. There's not a single Christian who gets through a day and says, that's it, I fulfilled God's word perfectly. I've got a completely clean conscience. I am the champion. Write this one down, God. It never happens. So this isn't about self-righteousness. This isn't about being better than your neighbor. This is about what do you do with the time that God has given you? What is the call of discipleship? What would you like to be doing? Um, I can tell you this, that from a, from a deathbed perspective, if you like, because that's where I've heard it, um, but then I'll, I think maybe even more poignantly, poetically, from a heavenly perspective, you're never going to go, I wish I did less good works. You're never going to say, yourself, oh, I really wish I would have let my flesh have its way. I really wish I would have lived more days in chaos and disorder. I really wish I would have prayed less. That was a big waste of time. Nobody ever has those thoughts. So don't, don't think, like, I mean, that's a trick of the flesh. You're wasting your time praying. You're wasting your time pursuing this. You're wasting your time pursuing vocation and, and r- good works. You're going to regret it. You're going to wish you just ate and drank and made merry like everyone else. Suck the morrow out of life. Go, hey, remember that stupid statement? Go skidding into heaven, you know, like, what a ride, you know, just... <laughs> complete ridiculousness uh so and then you get your bucket list because god's holding out on you so drink it all in get it all done there's not going to be any other opportunity um you know this kind of ethos we have just indicates how faithless and blind we are um we we hunger and thirst and starve for meaninglessness and nothingness and pablum spoon-fed to us by giant corporations so we want to break free from this, and that's kind of the point. Please. This whole concept of designing a spiritual practice has been a revelation, and I love the freedom in it because it's not an assignment. It's not, you know, to design your day, but then pay attention to the attacks or, the, you know, what the benefits, the costs and the benefits and keep keep going and pay attention to how it works. But what you just described is the incompatibility between mindfulness of what Christ would have us do, what God's word says versus what the world says. It's important to touch base a couple times throughout the day because you can see how the world wants to isolate you and make you the king of your world, Mm -hmm. where when you come back in prayer, it brings back humility and puts your mind in the right. And what you said about starting your day in prayer is important because a lot of people have this new mindfulness app where it helps you empty your mind. And well, what we need to do is fill our mind with God's word Mm -hmm. and practice that because it's so easy. It just goes away if you don't continue to come back to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm reminded. Thank you for that. I I'm reminded of, uh, Philippians chapter two, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then it's the humi- it's the humiliation, the theological sense of Christ that um, he did not count uh, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, was obedient to God completely and totally, but even to the point of the scandalous death on the cross. And it is precisely, I mean, this beautiful, glorious gospel presentation, Christ-centered, cross-focused presentation, and the whole point of it is not only that we would remember that our sins are completely forgiven in Christ and we're justified in Him, but as St. Paul says, that you would have this mind within you as well. And so, yeah, this this starts a long tradition, and it goes by various names, of mindfulness within Christianity. Um, just focus and attention on Christ and on um being conformed into his image, having his mind 
within us, having his mind be our mind, even as his life already is our life. So this is a way of just cutting it down and making it small. And you at least, I mean, even just in terms of like warfare and strategy, it's like in terms of spiritual warfare, it's like we don't even, if we don't have that basic order, we don't even, we're just kind of like shooting from the hip. Like, okay, there's something. (laughs) Okay, there's something. There's, but it's so much easier to, to really understand the lay of the land and the battlefield of the day, no more, no less. And then, and then the battle to pray also becomes like right now. You know, oh, I don't feel like praying. I feel like just rolling out of bed. Well, there's your opportunity to confess. There's your opportunity for spiritual warfare. There's the opportunity for you to go, what? And grab the old Adam by his throat and slam him down and say, no, I'm going to pray. And maybe now I'll say to our fathers, thank you very much. Uh, but, but this, this is where, um, you know, this is where the battle actually takes place. It's always much, much more humble than we think. We think it's these grandiose moments and all of this. And it's not true. And most of the grandiose moments are only made so by the drama of history, looking back on it and imbuing it with all. We as Lutherans of all people should know this. You know, Luther nailing the 95 theses. This was like some tremendous moment where the heavens were thundering with each other. No, 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 no. no. I mean, that, it's not much different than me posting a little uh, newsletter article um, with a with a push pin in the narthex. That's about what he did. A completely normal, inane thing that then God made big and uh, history has has glorified and amplified. But what we need to do is live like quiet and peaceable lives, as the scriptures say, but well ordered lives. And that's really what we're trying to articulate. What the catechism's given us. Okay, so far so good. All right. So all of this amounts to like. 145, very top of where we're quoting Romans 6, walking in newness of life. The oldness of life would just be you you do whatever you want to do. You try to eke out whatever pleasures you can do. The bad things you hardly lean into, you lead out of, you lean out of. You're trying to minimize your suffering and increase your pleasure, and that's all your life is. That's oldness of life. It's basically the way everyone who's not a Christian is living. Minimize suffering, maximize pleasure. And this is a whole new way of life because it doesn't even care. It's pleasure and, and suffering are completely disconnected from anything you're trying to do. Whether you receive them or not is, is quite secondary to the actual, the actual task at hand. All right, well, what... And I want to skip around on this just a little bit because I, you know, I don't want to spend, I don't mind spending um, 56 weeks on the text, but maybe not 56 weeks on good works. So with your permission, I will simply point out to you that Colossians 2 is quoted here on this page, and a number of other scriptures are woven throughout uh, these paragraphs that we're kind of skipping over. But on page 146, in this large type bracketed section you see baptism is the battleground of the christian life and so that's very this is also very freeing because you can do it even if the rest of your family is not on board you can figure out a way that you as an individual can live this way and then to whatever degree you can try to influence your family, this would be your kind of your vocational role or duty, would take that shape and form, to live the baptismal life together and to fight that out together. So baptism is the battleground of the Christian life. And there are a number of, of texts there cited in these paragraphs. If you jump down to the one, two, three, the third full paragraph on that page, our life. Our life is marked by this fight between the flesh and the spirit. But praise be to Jesus that this battle will soon end. And I'm, um, yeah, you're going to see where he goes with this. When the Lord Jesus returns for us, he will set us free from this sinful flesh and completely purify our bodies from temptation, sin, and death. Now we have the Lord's victory over sin and flesh by faith. One day soon we will have this victory by sight. 
the resurrection will mark the end of this battle and the complete victory of Jesus over our sin. Now, as we've been laying this Romans 6 baptismal foundation, as I've been articulating that and the shape and form it's taken throughout the scriptures, throughout all of history with God's people, and then given to us in the small catechism as Lutherans, Romans 6, upon which all of this is based, is followed by Romans 7. (laughs) And that's equally important. In Romans 7, Paul teaches us about the battle between our flesh and spirit. He ends this section with this doxology of hope. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. By law here, you can see the fluid way he's using it, like an axiom, a principle, a commonality, a commonplace. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. It is a remarkable thing that no doubt you've um, experienced this same thing, that as soon as there's the good thing, Satan tempts you toward the opposite. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Do you see the newness of life here? We no longer cower and fear underneath the law. We no longer look at the law of God as that which chiefly condemns us. It condemns the old Adam within us. It doesn't condemn us. We don't see the law as constraining our freedom, but rather as the shape and form and pathway that leads to greater and greater freedom. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, St. Paul writes. This, by the way, is one of the lines where we also know definitively that Romans 7 is is written when St. Paul is a Christian and of his experience as a Christian, there's no unbeliever who delights in the law of God in his inner being. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, so another axiom or principle or energy or commonplace, another law waging war against the law of my mind. So the law of my mind is delighting with the law of God, and then comes this other law, this waging war against that. And it makes me captive to the law of sin. So if you look, you've kind of got the law of God that connects with the law of my mind, and then this law of my members, which is the law of sin. The law of sin that dwells in my members. So I've got these two laws in opposition to each other. These two energies or forces within me in complete opposition to each other. Now this is, would be the point where Wolf Mueller would say, this is exactly the theology that's been lost in American Christianity. Uh, American Christianity just sees the person as much more whole and the battle much more being one of free will and here it's, no, you have this law of the mind versus the law of the members, this law of God versus the law of sin, and these are mortal combat. So there's not going to be a reconciliation. There's not going to be a betterment of the old man. Okay, so because this law of sin is at work in my members, dwells in my members, taking me captive... Then he laments, wretched man that I am. And that's what we mean as Lutherans when on Sunday morning we say, I, a poor, miserable sinner. Okay, by miserable it means wretched. It means I've got this law, this burden, this cancer within me that I want to be free of. So that's exactly the sense. One ex-Lutheran false teacher, um, televangelist woman in fact, says, I'm not poor, I'm not miserable, and I'm not a sinner. Okay, so you know where she's coming from. But when we say, I a poor, miserable sinner, we're reflecting on this Romans 7 reality that there's this uh, law of sin within us that continues to bring us captive. We fight against it, we confess against it, we delight in God's will, Sometimes it does bring us captive. Frequently it brings us captive. Then we confess against it and continue the fight. But this makes us wretched or makes us miserable. 
wretched man that I am, miserable man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now he gives us the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we remember, too, that this battle is temporary. And again, nobody laying on their deathbed, nobody upon entering in heaven and reflecting on their life goes, boy, I really wish I had um, you know, fought less. I really wish I had just let my sinful nature go wild. Nobody ever says that. So this is great encouragement for us to fight. And um, I, think, I think there's this... There's this a little bit of a beautiful reversal here. I haven't thought it all, all the way through, but I think it's still there. That in the same way, we've, we've meditated on this somewhat together, but maybe you've meditated on a more, and this is the fragility of the good, or the way that, you know, let's say hypothetically in terms of the personal spiritual warfare and battle, you, you fight nine battles against, you know, a given temptation, or to lose your temper or go buy something you don't need or whatever the case may be, disobey your uh, spouse in something that's going to grievously hurt them and isn't good. Uh, nine times you fight off the temptation on the tenth time you fall, how much credit does anyone give you? <laughs> Zero credit. Uh, so you can, you can fight, you know, this is the drug addict's problem too. You can fight for years and years, innumerable battles, but you fall once and everyone dogpiles on you and you've lost everything. And so all the cards are stacked against us in that respect. But there's kind of a paradoxical way in which this is all flips because you go, okay, well, if that's the way it is, and, and I think this is one of the temptations. The devil says, well, this is who you are or this is what you've done or this is who you've been for decades, so you're never going to get out of this. And in fact, it's hypocritical. You think you're special because it's, minute one or hour one or day one and you haven't done give up this isn't you you're a hypocrite you, this is who you really are now you're holier than thou this is the way the temptations go there's this beautiful way of kind of you know punching the devil in the throat by simply saying no just this minute then fine it's a minute you won't have just this hour then fine it's an hour you won't have just this day then fine it's a day you won't have and you build on that not that it's worth anything but it's just you want to you want to play petty you want to play fra- you know the, the fragility of of good I'll play the fragility of evil just not this one and may god be praised for that so there is a way of fighting back against this that's kind of um an enlightening and fun way to look at it because Satan will say, well, you'll never win this battle, so don't even try. And you can say, I don't have to win the battle. I just have to win this moment. It's, that's fine. I just have to win this day. It's fine. And many ways you'll find that as you resist the devil in just this way, he flees from you, as St. Peter promises he will. So there's more to it. If that moment, if that hour, if that day wasn't important, Satan wouldn't be hounding you so much over it. So he kind of betrays himself there too, that it actually does matter. Our prayers matter much more than we recognize they do. All right, so this is the Romans 7 reality. Now, what Wolfmuller does on 147 is introduces us to a Latin phrase that many Lutherans uh, know and use, and it's it's somewhat beneficial. It's somewhat uh, overused and misunderstood but if you look in the first paragraph, it's the second to the last line, simul justus et peccator, at the same time justified and sinful, or at the same time a saint and a sinner. And it's just expressive of the two different natures within us. And there's different ways, different arguments about how to understand this phrase, different ways in which it's understood in different contexts. Right ways, wrong ways, profitable ways, unprofitable ways. But really what it's trying to articulate is that until the day we die, we're going to have this old Adam within us that we're constantly fighting. And just because he's there and just because we sin does not mean that we're not saved. So this simul used to set peccator becomes an important thing. In some holiness traditions, I think this is f- somewhat rare, people will somehow come to conclude that they've come to a sinless state. Impossible. If we, if we say we have no sin, we 
deceive ourselves, St. John says. So if you've gotten to a holier state than St. John or a holier state than St. Paul in Romans 7, then you know you probably ought to re-examine your definition of holiness. <laughs> yeah, please. I was just going to ask one thing. Um, in, in our temptation, when we're in that battle, uh, I've heard it said that uh, we just say, in the name of Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Is, is this something that is a declaration a uh, or, or, mm -hmm. uh, it's great, yeah. Okay. Anything out loud. The large catechism teaches us that the devil hates God's name. We should use it frequently. So when we're under a temptation, that'd be a fine thing to say, God help me. Christ come to rescue me. Um, God save me. Uh, deliver me. Those kinds of things, as well as God be thanked, God be praised. Those kinds of art, um, articulations need to come flying out of our mouth all the time. It's wonderful. It's, and it... it it has an effect. I think that that's the other thing we don't realize because we don't, we don't see the spiritual world and realm all around us. And we're so pragmatic by nature that we don't see the effect. We don't even think there is an effect. But everywhere the church and the scriptures teach us otherwise. So to speak out loud the prayers, to read out loud the scriptures, uh, to speak out loud, um, get behind me, Satan, Christ, have mercy and save me, God be thanked and praised are profound and wonderful things. The devil can't stick around where there's someone praising God continually, especially someone praising God in the midst of, the su of suffering. Could you imagine how wretched that would sound to his ears? I mean, it would sound like the worst, most blasphemous, filthy, pornographic, disgusting thing you could imagine in your ears is how it sounds to his ears when you're thanking and praising God in the midst of, of suffering. Uh, so he wants nothing to do with it. He wants to flee away from it. So, yeah, to do that more often. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, I guess Luther actually threw up in a bottle of ink. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, supposedly that's the case. I think he reports that he had done that or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and we think of these people, I was going along with your sermon on Sunday, you know, we think of these people as heroes, and, but we don't identify as much with the struggles that they went through be, behind the scenes. You know, mm -hmm. we hear their public announcements, but they went through lots of struggling. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. And that's the shape of it. That's the way that God makes us into saints. Um, so Luther, Luther talks about it as theologians, but when we think of theologians, we think of like professional people with a degree. But that's not really how we should think of it. Every Christian is a theologian, is a student of God and of God's word is a disciple. So every Christian's a theologian in that sense. And how you make a theologian, um, and Luther stands on some other shoulders in articulating this, but it's uh, oratio, meditatio, and tentatio. So oratio is prayer, um, that that's what makes a theologian. And sometimes, sometimes that can even be as simple as the prayers we have in church on Sunday morning. But that life of prayer and then the tentatio, that's the, that's the affliction and the spiritual warfare, the battle. Sometimes in German, anfechtung is what it's called. And that's the struggle which you're talking about. And the other is meditatio. So meditatio is meditating on God's word, not just hearing it and going, okay, I got it, that's it. But meditating on it. Think, like our sermon this morning in the, in the little short service, the idea of knowing God's word and... Um, We've got this visceral language in one of our collects of uh, hearing it, reading it, learning it, marking it, inwardly digesting it, processing it, contemplating it. So praying it, you know, figuring out how to misunderstand it so that you can understand it better, all of these things. So this oratio prayer and meditatio on the word of God, meditation on God's word, and then the tentatio comes along, and that's involuntary. That gets laid upon you as the cross and it's the suffering. But this is how God designs and makes saints or designs and makes theologians. Please. Well, I agree with Barry, but I've also heard, get thee behind me, Satan. And he did. He pushed me. <laughs> yeah, all right. Right. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, should we press on a little bit? All right, so what we've got is this introduction to these three different states, and in fact there are four 
states, but the first three are introduced on 147. I am just going to briefly summarize as best as we can. You have the first state of Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall into sin. Now, the way I like to think of this is, I think I have a little different emphasis than Wolf Mueller. I don't think what he said is wrong. I, it has a tendency to mislead because it has a tendency to we view ourselves as neutral. And that's not the case. In the garden, Adam and Eve are good. They're already good. It's kind of like being on a boat going down a river, and the only way to get off the boat and stop going down the river is to jump out, swim to the side, and crawl out of the bank. That's what Adam and Eve had to do to get out of goodness. Everything they did was good. Everything they thought and said and did was good. There was just this one sort of exit don't eat of this fruit, and the day you do, you will surely die. So everything is leveraged toward the good in this state. And there's a very little theological controversy about this first state. So we simply introduce it to say that was a way in which human beings were, and that state no longer exists. Now, the second state is after the fall into sin and before conversion. What can a human being do in this state? And the answer from scriptures is nothing. No one seeks after God, no, not one. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. Those things of the flesh are contrary to those things of the spirit. And so no man can convert himself. This is article, this whole treatment of these different states is article two of the formula of Concord in the book of Concord, if you wanted to go read it for yourself. This second state, after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin and prior to conversion, is really Article 1 of the Formula of Concord, which is on original sin. It has to do with, remember that big word concupiscence, that our wills are set in antithesis to God. It's just God says X and we say not X. That's the second state. And then the third state is going to be man's will after conversion. What's going on here? And this is really, there's some controversy in terms of the second state because is man free to turn to God or not? The scriptures and the church for 2,000 years, aside from certain voices, has said no man can't turn to God. God has to convert man by his word and spirit. So there's the controversy in the second state. And the controversy in the third state is in what sense is man's will free after conversion? And that's what Wolf Mueller is going to have us focus on. And uh, again, what you have in Article 2 of the formula, it spells this out. So uh, it's the article called Free Will, and roughly the first half of it has to do with the second state, articulating that you can't do anything spiritual prior to conversion. And then the second half of that article has to do with this question of the third state, what can you do? And they say that Christ, because he's created a new man within us, has created a free will within us that can participate with God, although in great weakness and constantly falling, basically articulating what we just read in Romans 7. Okay? There is an inner man that now delights in the law of God, wishes... I mean, this is kind of one of the acid tests for a Christian. Like, do you wish you could push a button and have that sin go away forever? You'd be like, yes, that button would be jammed in so hard and so fast. Okay, that's the new man who desires to be utterly rid of this. No matter how weak and incapable he may be of fighting it off, he nonetheless wishes with absolute passion and certainty that it would be gone. All right, well, what's the fourth state going to be? The fourth state's going to be the Christian after death, after the old man has died. And now it's a return to an Edenic or pre-fall state. It's just in the pre-fall state, there was an opportunity to hit the exit button. Now there's no opportunity, so we're confirmed. Otherwise, Christ could never promise us eternal life. He'd be like, well, I promise you eternal life as long as you don't commit another original sin. God be praised, there's no opportunity for that. So this fourth state is much like the first state. Those are the four states in which we see mankind depicted in the scriptures. And again, most of our energy is going to be spent on the uh, second and third state. Now, I'm seeing that we're out of time. We're going to touch on those two states very quickly in the pages to come. 
But next week, we're really going to look to uh, go ahead to page 158 and talk about conscience, because that's something I think has not been talked enough about, and we simply need to talk more and more about um, conscience as the heart of the human being. And then we'll do a little bit more on good works, but we're, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And then we're going to talk about um, love and vocation coming in chapter 8. The Lord be with you.